Shot. He scores! And the Ballers win! Helena is no longer undefeated! I'm not superstitious, but I am a little stitious. Barons win! Barons win! Cody Jansen stopped 92 out of 95 shots, including a penalty shot in overtime. Somehow he still only wound up the third star of the game. You like that? Jansen has a heart. Y'all smoking crack! It's Cody Jansen with you, World Hockey Report, best of edition on this Wednesday. Yes, I'm taking the week off, but we're going to tee you up with three of the best conversations we've had over the past couple of months. We've got Tim Peel, former NHL ref, you know him, you love him. Tori Mitchell, unbelievable storyteller. And hey, women's hockey, it's in the spotlight. Elena Mills. Czech hockey star, world championship star from the Calgary bubble. Yeah, she's got stories to tell as well. Don't forget, go support DraftKings, the Hockey Podcast Network, punch in promo code THPM when you sign up there. Quack Stats, the most advanced player tracking technology, and 12-ounce sports, your home for sports talk on the internet. Go follow us on Twitter at World Hockey RPT if you haven't already. I'm on Twitter at Janner31 underscore. Already, let's get to it. It's World Hockey Report Best of Edition to close out the month of March. Let's go down to the States, and we got former NHL referee Tim Peel joining us, taking time for us on this beautiful Wednesday. And, and, and Tim, I know you're a busy man, so we're going to hop into some of the stories here. And in the first one, I heard it on Cam and Strick, and it was awesome. But you got to tell the story about scoring on Luongo. You got to walk the people through <laughs> that one. Hey, Cody, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, that was an unbelievable moment. Uh, Bortuzzo shot the puck in and I was in a good position in the corner. Usually the defensemen, they rim it around the boards or they shoot it on the net. They really don't shoot it towards the, the end boards. And, and I saw it coming and, and I couldn't duck because it was at waist level. And, and uh, I, I couldn't obviously jump up in the air. And it just kind of it hit me on the left hip. And a lot of people thought that it hit me somewhere else. But it hit me in the left hip. And, and it's, it, it's still... Uh, a mystery how it hit me on the left hip and then went right and went all the ways across the goal line and into the net. And, and as I, as I fell back, I hit my head on the, on the boards and the linesman came over and I was on all fours and on my knees and my, my hands. And cause I hear the horn go off at, at the uh, enterprise center here in St. Louis. And it goes off when the blues score. And, and I heard the horn go off and, and, uh, the linesman came over and I said, did that puck just go in the net? And he said, yeah. And I said, are you kidding me? So I, I went in and, and gathered my thoughts and came back on the ice. And I said to, to Luongo and Lou's like one of the best guys ever. I just love the guy. And, and he's like, he goes, Peelsy, are you okay? And I go, yeah, yeah. I said, Lou, I said, I'm great. But I said, you know what? For the rest of my life, I'm going to be able to tell people that I scored on Roberto Luongo. And he started laughing. So what's funny to finish the story up is three nights later, I'm in Chicago and Florida's in Chicago and he's not, he's not starting that night. They were going to start Reimer. And Lou comes right up to me as we're skating around. And he goes, Peelsy. I go, hey, Lou, how are you? He goes, they won't even start me now when you're a referee in our games because they're afraid you'll score on me. And we laughed. It was unbelievable. Gretzky texts me that night. He goes, you only need 714 goals more to catch Hully, he said. <laughs> That's hilarious. I'm glad they're able to joke around about that, though, right? Like, that, there'd, there'd be nothing worse than if you took actual heat for something. You're like, guys, you actually think I did that on purpose? Like, give me a well, break. <laughs> But that's one of the funniest videos. I can watch that video on repeat for hours. It's great. Hey, Tim, I also heard you do a, a recent radio hit talking about the Oilers. And up here in Alberta, Connor McDavid, it's always conversation. Why doesn't he draw more penalties? Well, who better to ask than you? Do, do you have a reasoning? Because in my mind, I feel like maybe he doesn't sell it as much as other players. And he's also so good on his feet where he doesn't go for these big tumbles. Like he's getting up right away. Is that just my opinion? Or why do you think Connor McDavid draws, you know, a third of the penalties that yes, the does. Well, and it's amazing, Cody. He is, he is 135th on the list right now out of all players that have drawn penalties in the league. And it just doesn't make any sense to me. I looked at four clips this morning and three of them, 
uh, are tripping penalties. And part of it is he is so, he is such a, he's the best skater I've ever seen in, in my, you know, my career and, and growing up. And part of it is he's going so fast that I don't think it takes much to, to knock him off balance, but he is such a tremendous skater that he's, a, he's able to gain his, his balance and, and stay up. But you know what? I think our, I think we need to start concentrating a little bit more on him. You know, I know in the playoffs there were, they were upset the Oilers um, with, you know, he didn't draw one penalty in the playoffs last year. And I, I think that it's, and I'm sure Kenny Holland, you know, Kenny Holland's one of the best GMs in the league and one of the most respected. And, and I'm sure he's had discussions with Stephen Walken, the director of officiating. He's probably shown Stephen these clips and said, hey, you know, the, are these penalties? And if so, why aren't they being called on the best player in the league? So it's a very valid point. So when when you look at some of those penalties that do and don't get called, one of my favorite parts and now being in that coaching world is seeing some of the animated people on the bench. And I know Dave Tippett can get a little red once in a while, but when you were refing, was there any coach who you were just like, and you don't need to call them out exactly for what they said or anything, but was there any coach where you just knew like, hey, this game, I know I'm going to get it from them every time we're playing? You know what? No, like I, I got a, I, a lot of our guys uh, had problems with certain coaches and so on, but I... I took it almost as a badge of honor to, to get along with the coaches. And, and I'll give you a quick example. Jamal Mayer is the ex-player. Him and I coach a select team here in St. Louis. And we were at a, at a game a couple of weeks ago, and it was a big game for our team. And, and I, all of a sudden, I caught myself yelling at the refs. And, you know, Jamal and I joked about it after, and I'm like, I can't do that. Like, geez, I, I can't yell at the refs. And, but I understand, you know, I play men's league hockey and you yell at the refs. I understand why people yell at the refs. And, and, but as far as the coaches, you know, like a lot of people would see Torts and Tortorella and, you know, he's very intense and, and Vino and, and different guys. But, um, you know, I, I took it, I, I wanted to get along with the coaches because if there was a situation where, you know, I missed something or things really got heated in the game. I wanted to be able to have a good relationship with the coaches so that I could go over and talk to them and explain myself and maybe calm down their team. And, and if you can get the coach on your side, then usually you can get the other 20 players on your side as well. Is there a tough barn though? Like, is there one rank where you're just like, these fans are ruthless and they're going to be on me from the start. Like is Philly that place or was there worse? Well, you know what? It's funny that you, you said that because I was going to mention Philly for the opposite reason. When I would go there, I would love, because, you know, we know, you know, the Eagles fans, you know, you know threw snowballs at Santa Claus that one time. And, and, and they're, they're known as ruthless fans, but I love them there. There was a guy, they call him the sign guy, and he, he's got a stack of signs. He's behind the visitors net. He's been there for 30, 40 years. And every time I'd come out, he, he'd put up a sign, refuse stock, and da 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 and so one night I'm having a couple of beers at a bar next to the rink and after the game and, and he comes over and introduces himself. So we have a few beers together and then the next game I'm, I'm there. And then for the rest of my career, it was like 10, 15 years ago, I'd skate out on the ice and he'd hold up, hold up the sign and would say, welcome back. And I always liked working in like, for example, I didn't really like working in Atlanta. I wanted to work in cities where these fans were knowledgeable, you know, any of the Canadian cities, obviously, but Chicago and New York and these cities that are knowledgeable because they know when we make a mistake and they get on us, but it never bothered me. You know, the old refuse suck when they would chant it. I'd kind of chuckle inside and, and I, I enjoyed that. I liked that the fans would be passionate and get into the game. It, it created a better experience. Tim, I got two more for you. It's World Hockey Report. I'm at Lord Co Auto Parts. Visit Lord Co's in-store truck centers at select locations. And, and the you know I gotta I dusted around at the minor levels of I won't even call it professional hockey. It's low level in Europe. But as a ref, I always wanted to ask someone this who's refed at a high level. Did you ever have to break up fights when your lines? You know, if you're running the lines for games, was there ever you know like fights when you're breaking into the league that you had to break up and you're like this is the worst? Like who who were those guys when you were cutting your teeth? Teeth in the refing circuit or linesman circuit that you just didn't want to be around. Well, 
back when I was in the American Hockey League uh, out of Fredericton, New Brunswick, they had a guy there by the name, they were Montreal's farm team, and his name is Jerry Fleming. And actually, I think he became the head uh, head coach of your of the Edmonton Oilers uh, farm team in, in Bakersfield for a while. Jerry Fleming was about 6'5". And when I throw this name at you, you'll recognize it, Link Gates. Link Gates. Oh, yeah. The Link, the missing Link, right? And he played for the Cape Breton Oilers. And this, these were two massive guys. Well, they had a, they had a huge rivalry in in the American Hockey League. And I was breaking that, you know, I'm 5'10", 170 pounds. And they went toe-to-toe one night in Fredericton. So much so, Gary Fleming kicked the crap out of Link Gates. And Jerry Fleming got called up to Montreal the next day to be their enforcer. So there were many times I used to I used to referee in the old International Hockey League, and we'd have bench clearing brawls every night. And even though I was a ref, I had to get in there and break up guys. And, but I enjoyed it. It was fun, and and you know I loved that kind of hockey back in the day. It was it was fun. It was exciting. It would get your you know if you couldn't get pumped up for that, then there was something wrong with you. Well, I figured you liked it. If you're still hanging out with guys like Janney and Myers and all those guys in uh, St. Louis area. Hey, yeah, I got Chaser, one more. Chaser. Oh, what? Oh, Chaser's, Chaser's there too. Here. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm yeah, sure you know like yeah. Darren Kimball, sure. all those guys around there. What a place to be. Oh, yeah. Kimby's yeah. awesome. Reed good good, Saska- good Saskatchewan Reed guy. Low, yeah. yeah, exactly. Hey, how many Olympics did you ref in? Just one or how many? Just one, just, yeah, the, the the one in Russia. In Sochi, usually our guys just just in Sochi. That's right. Usually our guys just work one Olympics. Uh, Stephen Walk and the director of fishing for the NHL. He does a good job of, of trying to reward guys that have been in the league for a while and and reward them with a with a uh, Olympics. And and I'm hoping that that you know we have the Olympics this year so that our guys can experience that because for for a kid. Uh, from a, a town of 1,500 people in Hampton, New Brunswick, you know, when I was in Russia, I was like, this is, you know, I used to, we had two channels on our TV in New Brunswick growing up, and to be able to be, be associated with the Olympics and have that as a memory, you know, it was just a, an honor and, and humbling, to be honest with you. Peelzy. So I just got a text on the text line from Tyler here. Shout out to him. He, uh, Jerry Fleming coached the Oilers farm system from 2010 to 2018. So there you go. You were right. You yeah. hit the nail on the head with that one. He was an OKC and Bakersfield. But I, I want to ask about the That's Olympics, right. so because it is an Olympic year, and from a refing perspective, I think it's got to be weird, isn't it? Like, am I off to say that how you ref a game in Double IHF and NHL is a lot more drastic than players make it out to seem? Like, you can't just flip a switch and be like, okay, I've got to call it a lot more strict or is it that easy for someone who's been doing it as long as you were no you know what our standard is very similar to what it is in europe the only difference is and we see it at the world juniors you know the officiating obviously is getting a lot better in europe than it used to be a few years ago you know we have a linesman from the czech republic libor suhanek that that is linesman now in the NHL and works playoffs. He's a, he's a great linesman, but we would always see you know those penalties in the World Juniors and that and that you know were they really penalties and and but I think that the NHL and the Double IHF has has done a good job of of trying to bridge that gap and 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 applying the same standard. You know, when I went to Russia, we had the same standard that we had in the NHL. The players didn't have to adjust. They knew what the standard was going to be, and the only difference, obviously, is you know, well, back back then it was a bigger ice surface, but now even the ice surfaces are the same. So the standard is pretty much the same, and the players know what to expect when they get over there. Well, that's interesting. That's an awesome perspective, and we'll leave it at that. Tim Peel, thank you so much. I appreciate you taking the time here. We'll connect down the road, but I, again, you know, best of luck with all your media ventures. You're in with some good groups there, and I know you got your own radio show on a Tuesday now with Strick, so that's got to be a load of fun. Yeah, it's great. Strick and I and Jamal Mayers, yeah. we, we started a few weeks ago, and we called it Hot Mike after my incident. Thought we'd have some fun with it, and uh, you guys have me on anytime. Uh, I really appreciate your reaching out, and, and good luck uh, going forward. And hopefully, we can talk soon. Pilsy, take care. Thank you again for everything. Okay, thank, thanks, Cody. Former NHL ref Tim Peel, right there, joining us on World Hockey Report.
The NHL season's been packed with dirty dangles, hat tricks, and big wins as the action rolls on. DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NHL, has your shot to win big, too. New customers can bet just $1 on any team and get $150 in free bets if they win. That's right, a bump in the win column for your team means free bets for you. If the sportsbook isn't available in your state yet, you still got a shot to light the lamp. Everyone can play for huge cash prizes with DraftKings Daily Fantasy Hockey Contest. DraftKings giving all new customers a free shot at millions of dollars in total prizes with their first deposit. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code THPN. Bet just $1 on any NHL team and get $150 in free bets if they win. That's promo code THPN at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NHL. 21 plus restrictions apply. See show notes for details. We've got Tori Mitchell on the line here making time for us. Hey, Tori, how's summer been? Pretty good. Pretty good. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Not a problem. Now, I know you're up to some pretty cool stuff right now with Elevate, and we are going to get to that. But first off, I mean, obviously, I'm doing a little bit of research. Not a lot. I'm not that big of a J. But how do you end up going to Hotchkiss? You know, like, what, what kind of led you there? Oh, yeah, good good question. My dad uh, was an athletic director at, a like, a private boys' school, uh, Catholic school in downtown Montreal that he forced obviously my brother and I to, to go there. Um, uh, we got like a good financial package obviously cause he was working there. And then just over the years, he had so many connections with prep schools, like placing kids down, not just for hockey, but for football and baseball and whatever other sports. But he just had, he had a pretty good connection with a couple of those schools. So when it was, when it was my time, he reached out to some of the, some of the better ones, I think. Um, and then that's how I ended up going to Hotchkiss. <laughs> and correct me if I'm wrong, but you're one of the, the rare NHLers to never play a junior hockey game. Is that correct? That's correct. That's <laughs> correct. No no junior hockey, which is, you don't really see that path too, too often. But yeah, prep school to college and then and then to uh, to San Jose. Yeah. Why, so. why Vermont? Were, did you, were you not getting any other offers or what? Like, obviously you're ripping up prep, but like Vermont, you just yeah. had, a, had a tour there and it felt right. Yeah. It was just, I, I had, I think I had like six or seven offers and came down to BU and, and Vermont and UVM. And it was just, I don't know. It was one of those situations where I pretty much was promised you're going to come in and be a first or second line center and it's your job to lose. And then on the flip side, like BU already had six, I think all six forwards that year were draft picks. So I would have been the seventh forward. It just was going to be it, way different vibe from the two schools. One was like, it's here, this your spot to lose. And the other was like, you know, might take you two or three years to, uh, work your way up the lineup. So it was just a better opportunity um, to play big minutes right away. So um, kind of made it a no, no brainer for me. Well, Hey, opportunities, everything at times. You also, I mean, once you make the jump to the NHL, you played San Jose, Minnesota, Buffalo, Montreal, and LA. And one of the big things I want to talk to you about, because it sticks out to me is that 2011 playoff run. I mean, I think you scored a couple of uh, goals there with San Jose, obviously a tough one. You lose out to Vancouver, but it was a close Western conference final, but just walk me through what that run was like for you. Cause that must've been pretty cool. Yeah, we we actually had I think it was back to back years we lost in the conference finals, so just never got over the hump. But um, boy, we had some just unbelievable teams. I mean, we I just I'm looking back at those years. Some of those regular season games, it was like automatic win. It was just <laughs> we'd rip off. It was crazy just watch. It, I mean, it was Joe Thornton and Patrick Marlowe in their like prime, prime, prime. Um, those guys, it was like it was pretty impressive watching them go and having to not, not fun chasing them around in practice, but, um, you know, to see them in their prime. I mean, I think Jumbo had like, I mean, he, he ripped off hundred point seasons, like nothing pretty much, but he was, it was just like so special to watch. And we just, um, yeah, we had two really good runs in the one year. I think we ran, yeah, the one year we ran into kind of the first, year that the Blackhawks had really like come into their own with Cannon Caves and Seabrook and Keith and Corey Crawford were kind of just 
still super young, but like really just took that next step and became obviously pretty good franchise after that. But, and then the second year we lost to Vancouver. Um, they ended up losing to Boston in the finals, but they were, yeah, we were, we were top two or three team in the national league two years in a row. So pretty, pretty good sucks that we didn't end up winning, especially for guys like Joe Thorne and Patrick Marlowe, but it would have been great, but we had, we had good enough teams to win, but just didn't get it done. Now I'm a Sasky guy. I grew up pretty close to Aneroid. So uh, families know each other with the Marlows there. You got to give me a good Patty story. A good Patty story. <laughs> oh. oh yeah. No, that's... Uh, I mean, he's, Oh, he's awesome. He, you know what? He went on, he went on spitting chicklets. So they asked him who is, who the funny, one of the funniest teammates he's ever played with. And he said me. And I was like, what? <laughs> okay. Humble break. Um, we just, I know humble brag, but he, he was like, I don't know. I had some stupid pregame routine that I'd like run around in my spandex and like, just always, always messing with him in like a really good way. And he just loved it. It was like kind of became part of our routine. I played with him for five years and it was just, I don't know. I'd run up to his uh, stall, give him a little throat chop and then sprint away. Cause he was, just a big teddy bear and he'd try to get me and then he'd stop. And then he was like, God, I, can't, I can't handle this Mitchell guy. And then I'd, I'd come back in like five minutes later, give him another throat chop. And he'd be like chasing after me around, around the rink, around the locker room, like right before the game, not a big deal. And, uh, Oh, that's probably a good memory. I have, if, if you ever get him on the show, he'll, he'll tell you how ridiculous my act was pregame. Oh, well, at one time we will. I used to always come and skate in Swift over summers too. So it'd be like him, Travis Moen, Zach Smith was a lot yeah, younger yeah. then, but a uh, great crew around there. So no, Patty's. Just, Pat, oh, I mean, tra- awesome Travis Moen, those guys, those, those guys are just like salt of the earth guys. Wait, would you have They're played with Moen so... in Montreal? I played with him in San Jose. Oh, no way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Another was, great guy. There, awesome. Just from the. Yeah, such a good guy. Actually, we were on a line together, which, you know, I mean, he's a pretty tough guy, so it's, he's nice pretty to have tough. on your line. So. Yeah, pretty pretty tough yeah. as well. Hey, I, I got to ask. I mean, I'd be reminiscent if I didn't about playing with JR. I mean, is, is there one funny story, and, and not one that you've told before? Give me something new about JR, something that sticks out where you're like, this guy's a character. Uh, yeah, let me think here. So, Oh, he, this, I like telling this story. He, uh, he gets done. I think the first period or second period comes in the locker room and he's yelling at our equipment guy that his, uh, he's, he's too pitchy back forward. I kid you not. He goes, Mikey, I'm too pitchy back forward, way too pitchy back forward. And our equipment guy's like, okay. Not sure what that means. Grabs his skates. I think he does like a quick run. I don't even know if he actually sharpened them. Maybe just put the stone over them and then brought them back to him. And he he came back after his first shift in the second period and gave him, gave him a thumbs up. And I don't think Mikey, I don't think Mikey had even touched his skates, but he fixed the pitchy back forward. Um, we had another time on the plane. So we would have been taking off and he got in one of, he was up all the players on the sharks plane were yeah, back of the plane and all the coaches were up like the first five or six rows. And he went in a box that slid all the way down to the back of the plane, right perfectly down the aisle and popped out with, uh, limited clothing on. But, um, just such a character to be around. Uh, just made it made it really fun to be, uh, especially at, at that stage of his career where he was like turning more like, okay, this could be my last couple of years. Like I want to be a good mentor to the younger guys. So, I mean, he was, uh, the, aside from all the fun pranks and stuff that he would play on us, he you know, he had his wife had us over for dinner every freaking weekend. We lived down the street from him. It was just a great, 
looking back, he was just, he was just such, such a great uh, mentor to have um, just because he, he loved it. He loved having fun. He loved working hard. He called you out if you were playing like crap. So he was pretty old school that way. It was just a good, uh, good two years with him for sure. I'm still pissed off that like TNT and ESPN aren't throwing the bag at him to get him on. I, I, I think that is the one guy when I think of players who could grow the game in the States, I feel like he would be absolutely perfect for it. And yeah. Well, he's Hall, he's Hollywood, you know, he's, he's like in a lot of ways, he's probably, I'm thinking of like football guys. He's probably like the, Deion, he's Deion Sanders. Like, you know, he's just like, I don't know. He's, he's great on TV. He's people love him. Cause he like speaks exactly the way. Like, I mean, anything that pops in his head, it's coming out. Um, you know, he just wears his heart on his sleeve that way, like his personality. And he would just, he, I mean, kill it, but yeah, you're right. But he's Hollywood showtime. His stick said Hollywood. He did not, it wasn't like, wasn't Ronan. Cause it's Hollywood. That's funny. That's, that's or Styles. Uh, sorry, Styles. That was his name. Styles. Nickname. Styles. Oh, that's. Uh, I think he's one of the ultimate no bucket warm up guys too. When you think about, oh you know, yeah, guys ripping around with perfect oh, yeah. flow. Hello, Jr. Perfect flow, bar down. He's got that gum, big wad of gum. He's uh, great crossovers and warm ups. Oh yeah. He's uh, he had that dialed in big time. Okay, okay. I got has, I, I got a couple big, more uh, uh, any, like, NHL ones for you yeah. too because I mean you played a couple of pretty damn good goaltenders. I mean it, yeah. if you're going game seven, you know let's go Stanley Cup playoffs. Are you taking Nabokov or Carey Price? Oh, Carey. Yeah. yeah. Okay. He's that's, that that's much uh, better, eh? I always uh, thought Nabokov was clutch, man. He's, no, I mean he's just he's just a different uh he's a different animal. He, he I mean he could and I played with who else did I play with? John Quick. So I played with Quick, yeah, Nabokov, Niemi, uh yeah, some pretty good goalies, but they I don't know, price price can be like if he's average for a month, he, the next month he's like goalie of the league for the month, you know. So you he's weren't surprised like, to see him just it. shut the door last year? No, I mean, so he when he gets like that, it's you just got to keep putting him in between the pipes and just ride him because he can literally let in one goal in five games when he's dialed in like that. That's how that's how good he is. The other the other goalies are all great goalies, and, you know, all stars and stuff. But some of the some of the runs that he goes on throughout the regular season where he just he gets so dialed in, it's like. There's, it's like nothing. There's no other goalies like it. That's um, fair. That's so. fair. Okay, and I want to get to your Spangler Cup experience, but actually just looking at some of your stats here, after after 1819 LA or whatever, you had six tucks still. Like, Were you surprised not to get another NHL offer? Did you get an NHL offer and just said, hey, I want one last year. I'm going to go to Switzerland, I, or what happened? Yeah, no, I didn't get any offers. I think I had a two-way, but um, – I would have, would have, uh, they made it pretty clear that I would have ended up in the minors. So that's when I, um, started looking at, uh, Europe. Um, no, I wasn't surprised. I mean, I, it was 11 years. It kind of ran its course. So you don't, we, we don't get a call. Like, like looking back on it now, when you don't get a call during free agency, uh, you kind of go through all these different phases, uh, in your, in your mind about, well, and you always you end up at oh it was a pretty good run you know so it it's it was you know it's disappointing when you don't get a call um, especially when you you want to keep playing um, but the reality is that's what happens to ninety nine percent of the players like you, you don't get to go out on your own terms uh, there's a couple guys that get to do that but for the most part you don't get a phone call anymore. And and I, I mean, you're not Patty so Marlowe, looking... obviously, but you still had six tucks. I, I think that might have been worth uh, a, a little more than a two-way. But again, that's why I'm not uh, running the team. No. Now, you, you went over to Switzerland, too. Like, how sick was that? Obviously, it's unreal. It was, I mean... it was... Oh, sorry, go. It was unreal. It was unreal. I, I got a... I suffered a terrible concussion, maybe like... For, would have been first or second week of January. But oh, it was... Uh, I mean such a beautiful country i had my three uh my wife and three kids over there we were going like up into you know, i get done with practice and you, you go up and you're in the 
Swiss Alps or French Alps and you're having a, you know, little coffee overlooking the mountains. Not, it's not a big, not a big deal. It's just part of what you do when you're, when you're playing in Switzerland, like as an import. So it was pretty, it was pretty sweet that way. Um, but I went through the ringer with my stupid head. It was like, Oh, it was a really, bad, it was a really bad concussion. Like I ended up staying in the hospital for a couple of days and then going through all the, like the horror stories that you hear about like throwing up and freaking living in a dark room for, three or four weeks and then like going on a walk and like having trouble like when you when you get done walking around for 20 minutes outside like i'd be like oh i gotta sit down like it was pretty now it was pretty nasty um but a lot a lot better now but it was like whew, crazy what, i, I, what, I uh, forget who did the article on it too I, I i did just read it the other day as well when i saw bryce had booked you as a guest here and, and i will get to that kind of in a joint with your new venture but also this the 2019 spangler cup i mean we got a sponsor who's doing a trip to the spangler cup so uh shout out sports travel tours yeah. but can you just talk about how unreal that tournament is <laughs> like it, it's something else it's, it's a once it's in a inc- lifetime it's experience inc- it's incredible um they treat you like olympians hockey canada does um, you know, taking care of your family, taking care of everything. It's just, you. it was my first experience with anything with like a national team. And it was, they just treat you like gold. And it's just so amazing. If, and for Canada, like if you, I think it, if you win, if you keep winning, you always have a day off the next day. So we went like three or four and oh, or going into the finals. So we had like, it was just, an amazing schedule. There's like blue skies. You're up in the you're up in the uh, freaking Swiss Alps, and you play a game, and then you have nothing the next day. And then play a game. We won. We kept winning. We ended up losing in a, uh, which was a bummer. Uh, we lost in the uh, finals in a shootout against some Finnish team that we outshot like sixty to ten. Um, but I got a silver medal. Still fine. All right. <laughs> I think that Dennis uh, cool, Godlow but... was in net for that Finnish team too. Young Slovak then he was nasty. What's that? Oh really? Yeah, they they actually yeah, they had a couple of young players that were pretty uh like you were like, Wow, these 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 guys can play in the NHL. Um but yeah, well we had I don't know, we had just a fun group of guys too. Um a couple of guys, there's like Kevin Bieksa and Dominic Moore, like they came over, they were sort of trying to make maybe one last kick of the can at maybe trying to get an NHL deal. So they, uh, hockey can, I'll let them come over and maybe use the tournament to, to get in shape, to maybe get a tryout or something, um, back in the NHL. But I don't think anything came of it for them, but, uh, wasn't BX a blowing guys up in that tournament. Is that the one I'm thinking about? Oh, I mean, just no one went near him. (laughs) I remember seeing, remember seeing a few. Just, yeah, just crushing guys. Um, but, um, yeah, great. Such a fun tournament. Okay, now with your new venture, and, and, and you know, we, we talked about how, how your career didn't exactly end as you want. At least you didn't have to go to Russia. But, uh, no, it's, you know, d- dealing with some of those head injuries post-hockey and stuff like that, obviously I, ho- I hope you're in a good spot right now. I hope you're feeling good and healthy and all that. But with the Elevate and stuff, I, I know you guys focus on a lot of skills, and obviously a lot of the stuff that people see is the social media yeah. side where you guys are just ripping through schools, stick handling and rollerblades and shit like that, which is hilarious. <laughs> but, no, talk talk to me about this venture. How did you get into it? How did it start? Yeah. Who's helped you out? And what are you guys yeah. doing? Yeah, well, it started, um, you know, I started start thinking about life after hockey uh, while I was in Switzerland, really. Um, kind of writing was on the wall that the end was uh, very near. And um, my partner, Peter Lennis, um, I think, well, he actually had a year left on his deal in Austria, but we had always talked about doing something together. Um, and then, you know, the hockey training, if we could have our own ice, that would we think explode we thought that would be a great small business and um you know we'd get a lot of get to teach some kids and get a lot of young hockey players on the ice and kind of you know stay in the game and make our own hours and so it started from that um and then it's morphed into uh, a lot bigger than that it's uh, huge don't need so to sugarcoat it's, it holy shit you guys got like a bauer hockey yeah. rink you're massive on social media you got gomer involved <laughs> now oh pump your tires yeah, man it's yeah, awesome we just, 
yeah, it's, it's, thank you. It's, it's been, uh, like a lot of, I don't know. We just love coming here and we got kind of Vermont's our headquarters and we have our first, uh, satellite licensee agreement, uh, at Elevato to Boston opened up. I'm not, not going to call them a franchise yet, but, um, and they're doing well and it's just all pretty much from our, uh, you know, just our little idea of training kids and doing skill development. Um, and then shifting a lot of our energy to social media to see if, you know, there would be any interest to grow it outside of our little state in Vermont. And the feedback has been insane. It's like we got so many people um, from ex NHL players to ex European pros to current college players to hockey dads. So uh, like interested in finding out more about potentially doing one of these, um, in their city or in, in their town. And we've had, uh, upwards of 15 to 20 NDA non-disclosures sent out, uh, to some of these spots. And, um, a couple of them are looking like they're going to stick. Uh, so we have Elevato to Raleigh, uh, in the works. We have Elevato to Tampa Bay in the works, Elevato to Vegas, um, Elevato to New Jersey, which are all like pretty, pretty close. Um, so pretty exciting for us. And the biggest part was just shifting a lot of our attention to social media to, I don't know, just to, just to show like, it's, it's fun. Like we're not reinventing the game here with hockey training, but uh, we can make it fun. And if we hire the right people at all the locations, I think um, the energy and like flair and, and all that that you see on our social media pages uh that's that's what we bring on the ice too so i think parents and kids are just, are just like they feel that excitement when you have the right person or the right energy when you're doing a lesson and it's just kind of organically grown uh that way so yeah it's been it's been really fun well, essentially, so. you're, you're evolving with the game, right? That's the biggest thing is that how do you keep new kids involved? Obviously, they're, they're not wanting to learn about fighting. You know, half the time, checking classes aren't even around anyways. It's about skill. It's about having fun. It's about developing. And now you incorporate them in social media. You're, you're hitting the nail right on the head there. So that's awesome to see that you guys yeah, are they- growing and stuff. Hey, uh, are you guys putting on camps? Is it all like uh, like private lessons? Or how can people, you know, if they are in Vermont, if they are near Boston, or you know, one of the new centers that'll be opening up, you know, how do they how do they get in touch? How do they uh, get involved? Yeah, they, honestly, so Elevator Two Boston has their own Instagram page as well, and they, you you could get in touch with us on on social media. It goes to Peter or myself directly, and. Same thing, uh, you can go to our website and get in touch with us. Just email us, info at elevator2.com. And same with the Boston guys. Um, you know, they, they have their Instagram page with their info. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's – so the Boston location actually is almost 50 by 80 feet. So their uh, training model is a little bit different than ours because um, they can fit four or five college kids on the ice. So it – uh, our, ours is a little bit smaller. We're kind of we were kind of the guinea pigs for for uh, starting the business, obviously. But um, we mostly do we're, our sweet spots two two players on the ice, um, and uh, we are going to be doing a camp this summer. I'm not supposed to be announcing that yet, but that's the, that's yeah, the plan. We won't tell to, anyone uh, who's watching that. Uh, <laughs> well, we're we're actually announcing it tomorrow night on okay. Instagram. So we've we've been saying like October one, we get a big announcement. And everyone keeps asking us there. I just spilled the beans, but that's okay. Um, yeah, we're gonna do a big camp and try to bring in some NHL players and some guest appearances and some. We got some good some fun stuff lined up. But uh, it's actually gonna be at Norwich University in, in Northfield, Vermont, which is a great uh, campus. Nice bar. For, uh, Nice barn, yeah, really nice barn. It's pretty much a Division One rank, and it's uh, no, it looks uh, it looks promising. We'll see, we'll see what the signups are on on starting tomorrow night. So, there's no way you guys don't sell out in a day with your social media presence. No <laughs> yeah, chance. I, 
it, it's no, but honestly, it's we we don't know what what we we're expecting the phone to ring a lot and to see a, a lot of signups, but just the power of social media, man. It's like the kids love it. The kids love it. It's uh, it's so crazy. And when we started, we we said, you know, let's let's get our Instagram page going, and then it like wow, we just it, it compl- our business like model like completely shifted to let's put more into this and and from that like we got you know we were social influencers with with bauer which is a huge deal for us we have like exclusivity with bauer for any small rinks they won't sponsor any other small rinks but ours um we're actually going to call it the bauer elevator to bauer camp um and then for the for the summer and then i mean we got we got deals with hockey shot bio steel uh uh, green biscuits. Uh, well, I hope I don't forget anyone. Pure hockey. It's it, all from social media. All of it. It's uh, actually Peter's going down to like this this bow. It's called like the Bauer Experience or something. Uh, in two weeks, uh, my partner he's going to speak at it uh, about just just the power of social media, like what it's done for our little business that we started out with a little idea in in small Vermont and. Um, and it's all from social media. It's all like kids being like, wow, that looks so exciting to get on the ice there, like, and do some of these drills that, you know, we're not, re- like I said, we're not reinventing the wheel, but it's, it's working. So we're going to ride the wave. No shit. It's working a little bit there. Hey man, I appreciate you taking the time. I know we kept you for a lot longer, but Hey, it was awesome getting you to tell no, some stories good. and hey. talking about what you're doing. So man, I appreciate that. Maybe yeah. we'll uh, catch up down the road. If you got to pump up your uh, camp anymore. We will uh, stay in touch. So, sounds good. I, I appreciate you having me anytime. All right, All right man. Uh, you'll have to. You'll have to. Uh, we'll have to tag you. If, I don't know what you guys have for Instagram, but we'll have to uh, do something whenever this. I know you said it's live, but oh yeah, I'll, sh- I'll shoot that. you. I'll shoot you a text. Okay, sounds good, man. All appreciate right, Tori, it. take care. Right there, Tori Mitchell, joining us on World Hockey Report. The NHL season's been packed with dirty dangles, hat tricks, and big wins as the action rolls on. DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NHL, has your shot to win big, too. New customers can bet just $1 on any team and get $150 in free bets if they win. That's right, a bump in the win column for your team means free bets for you. If the sportsbook isn't available in your state yet, you still got a shot to light the lamp. Everyone can play for huge cash prizes with DraftKings Daily Fantasy Hockey Contest. DraftKings giving all new customers a free shot at millions of dollars in total prizes with their first deposit. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code THPN. Bet just $1 on any NHL team and get $150 in free bets if they win. That's promo code THPN at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NHL. 21 plus restrictions apply. See show notes for details. What we do here is go back, 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 back. World Hockey Report, we are presented by Lord Co. Auto Parts. Find a store near you at lordco.com. Second store coming in Edmonton. And be sure to check it out on Calgary Trail Northwest. The absolute best. It's the absolute best. Come on. You already know that. Lord Co. Auto Parts. Hey, let's snap it overseas now. Alina Mills joins us. Czech national team captain on the line. Hey, Alina, has it worn off yet that you've uh, qualified for the Olympics? Or are you still buzzing about that? I'm definitely still buzzing about that just because uh, women's hockey isn't that big in Czech Republic and now still have a lot of unanswered messages on uh, WhatsApp or Messenger and whatnot. So I'm definitely enjoying it and still kind of riding the the high wave of excitement. Now, now you say it's not that big, but I was seeing some of the videos. I mean, you qualified in your home home country too. That's cool enough. I Chamatov. I'm probably going to butcher it. I spent two months in Czech Republic. I wasn't any good at <laughs> hockey, so that's as good as my Czech's getting today. But you got to play it at home too. Like, how awesome was that? Being in front of some home fans, you know, having that little boost to to get you over the top. Oh yeah, the fans were awesome. Like we finished last game, they're still standing there for ten or fifteen minutes and celebrating with us, cheering us on. So that definitely helped. And like I mentioned, it's it's probably one of the biggest events that we've had in Czech Republic for the for the women's game. So uh, yeah, huge thanks to the fans. So let's go back to the World Championship, and I feel like. 
Correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like that's really where your team got a little bit of a confidence boost saying, hey, we can play with some of the best teams in the world. Maybe all the scores in a, in a full 60 don't go your way, but there has to be some belief, Elena, that after that World Championships in the bubble in Calgary, you're saying, hey, we're good enough to you know compete in the Olympics. We're good enough to qualify for it. How much momentum did you take from that? Uh, I think we definitely took a lot of momentum and I think we've been going towards this for the past year and a half uh, ever since we got a uh, new coaching staff and I think at Worlds we still had that underdog mindset and we didn't quite we didn't quite believe that we could play against some of the top teams but playing for example against Finland and yeah we ended up losing 1-0 but we definitely felt like we were in a game we were no worse than them so I think they gave, that gave us that confidence boost but it also taught us what else we have to work on and uh, that helped going into the qualification. So after uh, after Calgary, I mean, how did you feel about your own game? Because I feel like for you, everyone on TSN's talking about you in Canada. I mean, you had some nice snipes. Let's not uh, let's not sugarcoat anything. You <laughs> tore it up a couple of games. For you personally, how do you feel about your game? Like, obviously, it's tough going through COVID as a hockey player, but you didn't miss a beat. Uh, yeah, definitely. Actually, I think it kind of worked uh, to my advantage. Uh, and as far as the sniping goes, that uh, definitely have to attribute it to our assistant coach, Max Markowitz. So uh, he deserves the credit there. He's worked with me every day all last season. Um, so that's helped a lot. And then with uh, things being canceled initially, as far as worlds go, that helped me to get in touch with a new strength and conditioning coach. So I gotta say, I am getting older, but I'm feeling better on the ice. So uh, all of those bad things uh, related to COVID kind of helped me to meet the right people and, and get better at hockey. So let's talk about your career. How did how did you get a you know a hockey stick in your hand? What obviously checks a huge you know hockey country, but who was it who got you involved in the game? Um, I think accidentally my parents, it wasn't their intention. They just wanted to teach me how to skate. And I actually ended up stealing the hockey stick from my brother, who's three years older than me. So I was very stubborn ever since I was a young kid and just kind of cried because I wanted to play and my parents wouldn't let me play. And uh, then eventually they got me my own gear and I, I stuck with the game and then they supported me as well. So, so what brought you over to the States then, where you played prep school at SAM? Like, what was, I guess, kind of what was the reasoning for it? Was it just more development? Were you, did your parents move over, or, or how did that go? Uh, my parents definitely didn't move over. They stayed in check, and uh, it, was, uh, it was always my dream when I was a little kid, um, knowing that U.S. and Canada are ahead uh, in a women's game. And obviously, I watched the NHL and being a little kid, I had no idea that I would never play there as a girl. So it was my dream to come to America, play hockey, play one of the best hockey uh, that I can play. So it was just like my dream that, um, again, I ended up getting luck lucky meeting the right people who directed me towards Sam. And that was the, one of the best four years of my life. I know people say that's college, but for me, that was definitely high school at Sam. So, how did, I mean, obviously you're a genius if you go to an Ivy League school like Brown, but like, how <laughs> smart are you? Like, what did you, what did you major in? What, what's, what's the education right now? I mean, I'm definitely not that smart because I definitely haven't, I haven't uh, touched anything academic ever since then. Uh, I majored in international relations. Um, but yeah, I was, uh, I was undecided for a long time. I was in commerce organizations and entrepreneurship for up until my junior year. So basically two years and, uh, yeah, I would, I wouldn't say I'm that smart. <laughs> okay. I'll disagree with that, but I like your humility. <laughs> now, w what took you over to Russia? Was it just money that you're kind of like, Hey, they're throwing around good money. You know, it's going to be a lot more than if you stay in North America and, you know, play in the NWHL or CWHL, whatever league was around at the, the, the time when you graduated. Was it a money thing? Was it something you, you kind of always wanted to go to Russia or what? Um, no, actually, quite the opposite. Coming from the Czech Republic and, uh, you know, Czech being occupied by the Soviet Union back in the day, uh, there's not much positive things going around about Russia. Yeah. So it wasn't my dream. It was, again, a little bit of a little bit of luck. But uh, after spending eight years in the, in the States, I was like, oh, I know English. Uh, what else can I learn? And, you know, back then there was the CWHL, um, but it was still developing and I, I didn't feel like 
it, w- it was the right path because a lot of the times it would just be practices twice a week. And I wanted to continue in that college scheme where you're practicing four or five times a week, playing two games every week. And back then, the only opportunity was Russia. I was t- looking at Finland back then, too. Um, and then new team opened up in St. Petersburg. I got an email and I was just like, well, in college, I always complain about, oh, I have to do school. I have to work. Uh, I had a job on the side. I you know, had to do hockey. It feels like I'm having three jobs at once. So I wanted to have that opportunity of just- Might have, might have just uh, had her cut out. We'll, we'll try to get her back. It's uh, interesting. She did go over and play in Dynamo St. Petersburg after that. Maybe we got some uh, Czech Wi-Fi issues. But, I mean, Elena Mills. Can you hear me now? Oh, there we go. We got her back. We got her back. Uh, you, you cut okay, out. what did you hear? You, you cut out a little bit when you were talking about going to Russia. But I, I just want to ask, I mean, how sick of a city is St. Petersburg, though? Like, obviously, there's two in Russia where if you're there, you want to be in them. And that's Moscow and St. Petersburg. So what was it like living there? It was awesome. It's still awesome. Uh, my husband lives there. I live there. So uh, I go back as much as I can. I uh, Definitely Moscow, no go. Go to St. Petersburg. Really? It's for everyone. So yeah, it's, it's way better than Moscow. Okay, okay. So we're getting some mixed stories here from former guests of the show. Some <laughs> saying St. Petersburg is a little overrated. But you're telling me that Moscow avoided at all costs. <laughs> Maybe not avoid, but definitely go to St. Petersburg <laughs> no, no, if you have to choose one. Hey, obviously, uh, you know, going going and playing in China for a little bit, that must have been an experience. But uh, what what was it like? Was it a money thing that, uh, that, that sucked you there? I know that there's a, a couple of owners of hockey clubs in China that have bees in front of their net worth. So uh, was it just a money <laughs> thing for you going from Ufa? Uh, no, I ended up being a hockey development. I knew I knew the coaches there. So again, it was, hey, I'm getting older. This might be my last chance to get a shot at the Olympics. So I want to be as well prepared as I can be. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm not going to lie. The team is well supported and uh, the team gets, as far as I could put in, a lot of things that other women's teams don't. But for me, the main focus was hockey development uh, because I knew the coaches could help me to get to the next level. Well supported, a.k.a. a nice way to say you're getting paid a hell of a lot more than if you were sticking it out in the CWHL or the NWHL. Hey, I, I, you, I mean, you're, you're Russian League legend there. There's, you're all over Twitter about your performances at the All-Star Game. And if people haven't seen it, we'll tweet it out from the main account at World Hockey RPT. But you dressed up as Yarmir Yager, a Czech legend, of course, at the All-Star Game in the shootout. Like, wh- where does that come from? Are you thinking of that like the day before? Or are you kind of like, hey, if I ever get here, I'm going to do something crazy that people are going to remember me for? Uh, it actually came from my husband as a joke when we're discussing that I am the oldest player on the women's team and he's the oldest player on the men's team. And actually it turned out that it was like a big anniversary and he was supposed to be there because there used to be a Jagger's division uh, or Jagger's team for the All-Star game a few years ago. So uh, the All-Star organizers were really excited about it because kind of went along with the theme again by accident. And it started as a, as a joke. And I know he played in KHL and he did a great job. So kind of a tribute to him for uh for his playing career okay i got one last one for you i mean the stories have been incredible elena we appreciate you taking the time but i gotta ask and i know the olympics are coming up so i'm sure that the you know it didn't go on a two-week bender or anything but you had to have had some fun after qualifying for the olympics in your home country like were you guys treated like royals or what like no chance you paid for a pivo for a week uh, I wish. Uh, we had a cup of after after the game. Uh, most of our celebration happened right after because it is the middle of the season for a lot of girls. So they headed right back to their clubs. Some of them actually in the middle of the night, some of them in the morning, wow. some of them next day. So the celebration was cut short. Um, as I mentioned before, it wasn't necessarily just about, about the pivot, but it was about the attention that now a lot of the players are getting and women's hockey is getting in check, which is the great part about it, too. So do you think there'll ever be, you know, a competitive Czech league that, that starts up? I know you're playing in Finland now and women's leagues. It's tough to, you know, compete with the SDHL and what the, you know, the, the Russian women's league is doing. But do you ever think that there's, there's going to be a market for a Czech women's league or no? Um, I think that's a long way to go. Yeah. I hope so. Um, but I think it's going to take a long time to develop that league.
Hey, that's fair. It's it's interesting to watch the market. I mean, we both know Nick, and he's obviously he's got his hands on everything. The guy's a genius hockey wise. But it's interesting yes. to see where like the EWHL is going. It's interesting to see how Austria kind of you know they're pitching in some teams. I, I'd be surprised if Prague couldn't support it. But again, you'd have to get the the rich folks over at Sparta to to kind of open up their wallets once or twice to support something other than their men's team that can't win anything. But well, uh, well, yeah, maybe you can help me to give them a call. <laughs> oh, I'm sure they're going to love my my word for my one <laughs> game in most and my uh, quick stop in Chescalipa. I'm sure they're going to love that. <laughs> Elena, thank you so much for hopping on the show, though. We appreciate it. Best of luck at the Olympics. Can't wait to watch you, and hopefully you can have some success there and win a couple of uh, huge games on the biggest stage. Thanks a lot, Cody. I appreciate you having me here. Elena Mills right there, Czech national team. She's the star, let's be honest. All right, I hope you enjoyed some of those conversations there. Some of the best from World Hockey Report over the past couple of months. Huge thanks to Tim, Tori, and Elena for taking the time. Don't forget, though, go check out DraftKings. Use promo code THPN. Check them out. They're the absolute best. And Canucks launch Monday through Thursday on the Hockey Podcast Network YouTube channel. Go check out a subscribe and also go check out 12 Ounce Sports. As always, everyone, be kind, be better.